Reuters placed this shocking, sad picture on social media. Look at this. You know, my heart breaks for these unhappy protesters in Lebanon. What's going on here? I want to tell you I love the people of Lebanon. I'm deeply indebted to them for my research, especially the archaeological faculty of the Middle East University. On October 17, 2019, approximately 100 civil activists were protesting against the new proposed taxes in, in and around Beirut downtown, blocking important streets. Look at this. You're looking at history here. It's a sad history. Doing my archaeological research over many years, <clears throat> kind Lebanese people assisted me in finding different ancient archaeological sites which were forgotten during the war against one another. And uh, I'm indebted to them. I appreciate them. I love the people of Lebanon. Besides the internal anger of the Lebanese people, there are also external enemies. You read about them and you look at them on Amazing, on Amazing Discoveries Channel and uh, Al Jazeera, CNN. Who are the real enemies of the Lebanese people? Is it the government? Is it uh, neighbours? Who is the real enemy of Lebanon? By the way, who's the real enemy in your life? Your wife, your husband, your child, your neighbor? Who's the real enemy? We have to understand this very important lecture. A little later, I'm going to share with you my traumatic experience caused by an air raid when I slept here. Here you see the building at the Middle East University in Beirut. This was scary. What a sight. Missiles were turning the night into day. You know, you cannot really sympathize with the Lebanese people if you haven't gone through this kind of experiences. They know about war. We don't know about war like they do. I shared with this lovely couple the mystery of the many columns that you see in the background here in the sea. This is uh, Tyre. Now, these columns in the sea will become some of the links to explain some, uh, to a certain extent, the present turmoil in Lebanon. So try and save this picture in your mind. My story begins at Nippur, an ancient Sumerian city in Iraq. A prophet by the name of Ezekiel, who lived here, prophesied that Tyre would be destroyed and cast into the sea. You can read this in his book, Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 12. Now this is a very daring prophecy. The greatest coastal city would disappear in the sea. <laughs> I think the scoffers laughed at this prophecy. But before taking you to Tyre in Lebanon to show you the fulfillment of the prophecy, I have to show you some of the amazing sites in Lebanon. When you do research about Lebanon, you never get enough. It's a beautiful country. At present, a country with a sad history. Let's start our visit with a visit to Baalbek. I'm sitting on the base of one of these huge columns. Hey, man, <laughs> these were builders. But behind this base of the column, there is a foundation. The Romans built on this foundation, the largest ever found in human history. Let me show you some more. Look at this. 
Is it pre-flood or post-flood phenomenon? Uh, I'm not sure. Your estimate of the weight of this foundation stone? You cannot calculate it. Look at this one. And allow me to show you another mega foundation of the Bacchus temple. The Romans came and they built upon the ancient foundations of Baalbek. Can you see to the left of this huge Bacchus temple, two people and another few people at the back. This just gives you an idea of the huge size, just of the foundation of the Bacchus temple. Now, from where did they get the building material? You have to walk 800 meters to come to the quarry. There you are. I tried to lift this one, but I couldn't move it. 1,500 tons. And they had to carry these columns uphill for 800 meters to use them in the construction of Baalbek. Absence of inscriptions of how, who, and when Baalbek was built. It's absent. Absent. Here's another one. Gobekli Tepe, Turkish for Potbelly Hill. Strange name. It's an archaeological site approximately 12 kilometers from Sandi Urfa. More than 200 of these T shaped pillars were found some weighing up to 70 tons. And only 20 of these circles are currently uh, visible. There could be more. Why no inscriptions? Noah did not bring an alphabet to the post-flood world. He brought brilliant stuff in his mind, but he couldn't write. This is either a pre-flood, no alphabet, or post-flood site before cuneiform writing was discovered. <clears throat> Around 1050 BCE, a Phoenician alphabet was used for the writing of Phoenician. It became one of the most widely used writing systems in the ancient world. Phoenician merchants across the Mediterranean, spread it everywhere they went, wherever they traveled. And the world used this alphabet. I salute the Lebanese of Phoenicia for giving us this precious gem of an alphabet. And here you can see it on these artifacts. While walking through the rooms of the Echmun temple near Sidon, a thought came to me. You know, we should try and think about what we see. Internalize it. See if you can find precious lessons. This is the only site in the Middle East where the last four world empires who subjugated Lebanon left their evidences. Lebanon has got a very sad history. I feel for them. Nar al Kaw, place to visit. The Beirut Museum, great historical places with great historical messages. Studying Lebanon, you are enriching yourself. After the Egyptian power were oppressed the Phoenicians and they were buried in the sarcophagus of history, the Assyrians occupied Lebanon. They hardly had a break. Shame. I found some of their footprints at Nar al Kalb in Beirut, the Assyrian footprints. Here's one of them. This is the Assyrian king Esarhaddon who subjugated them. Tiglat Pileser III, Adadnirali III and Sennacherib were also oppressing Lebanon. When you read the history of the place, you feel so sad. And I think this is the gem of all the Muslim Eastern countries. It's so beautiful. Assyrian warship built by Phoenicians. They built it for the Assyrians. This was found in Nineveh, 700 BC. 
after the Syrian occupation, Nebuchadnezzar II came here in 586. He fought against Tyre and only after 13 years, that's a long time, 13 years siege, that he managed to destroy mainland Tyre. He did not destroy the other Tyre that's on the island, about a kilometer away from the mainland Tyre, but uh, Tyre in the sea became a vassal of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The Babylonian Zicharut, you can see it here just in front of the podium built by the Syrians. It confirms the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was here. By the way, we're going to find all four civilizations right here. One of the greatest archaeological evidences that the prophecies of the book of Daniel are accurate. His Nar el Kelp inscription, that's of Nebuchadnezzar, is further proof that he occupied Lebanon. Not only the Zicharut he built, not only the destruction of mainland Tyre, he left his footprints here. I found another one here at Wadi Briza. Poor Lebanon. Who would be your new rulers after the Babylonians? If Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tai in 586 for 13 years before he destroyed it, what year was it? 573. When did Cyrus become the next ruler? 539. So where did Cyrus go after he captured Babylon? Well, his father-in-law, Darius the Mede, stayed behind and he became the ruler of the Middle Persian Empire. But Cyrus was here in Phoenicia, Lebanon. He divided Phoenicia into four vassal kingdoms. Sidon, Tyre, Arvat and Byblos, and you're looking at Byblos. Any more evidences about the presence of Cyrus in this area? At this stage, Phoenicia had to build ships for his Medo Persian Empire. This also became the rulers of the ancient oceans. Well, it's not ancient anymore, it's new and modern. He proved his sovereignty over the Phoenicia by building this huge podium next to the Babylonian Zicharut. So I see Nebuchadnezzar here in the first little Zicharut, of course it's ruins today, and then I see Cyrus just behind him. The mighty fleet of Cyrus was invincible under the bronze kingdom of the Greeks to this part of the world and became the new world power. So poor Lebanon was under a foreign ruler. What could this Phoenician warship tell us about the Greek rulers in Lebanon? You know, Lebanon has got a history drenched in tears and blood. I was so impressed when I came across the sarcophagus of Alexander the Great in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. Man, this, this man played a major role in the history of the world. Alexander the Great invaded Phoenicia in 332. Poor Lebanon, another ruler. So what happened to the, to the Tyre island after refusing to become a vassal of Greek? You know, this, this, is, this is a great story. Now when Alexander came here and the Sydney wouldn't uh, capitulate to him, he sent emissaries to have a peace talk. But you know what they did? They put them in the sea. They drowned them. They killed them. And this great ruler, Alexander the Great, said to them, I'm going to build a ramp up to the island. And he did. After the Greeks came the Romans. This land of the Lebanese people had to adjust to a new conqueror. The Greek and Roman rooms at Egmont confirm the painful history of Lebanon. And now for the answer to the title of this lecture, Lebanon, crisis, future demise 
of the enemy. The prophet Ezekiel uses an interesting literary device to identify a dangerous, destructive enemy. Let us ask him to explain it to us. If you grasp this, a new chapter will open to you. The word of the Lord came to me again, that was while he was at Nippur, saying, Son of man, say to the, remember this word, Prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God. Now Ezekiel refers to the narrative of an historical, wicked, local, ethnic ruler of Tyre. This is where he begins to explain typology. Now besides his degrading sensual sins, he also sacrificed infants to his cruel God. So he was the most wicked upon the planet. Because your heart is lifted up, the little king of Tyre, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man, not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, he ends the following description of the demise of this wicked ruler as follows. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now this is the narrative of the literal prince of Tyre. Ezekiel uses him as a type of another more wicked, global, and greater end time sadistic ruler. And if you can grasp this truth, things that's going on in the world today will become crystal clear to you. And going on in the life, your own life and people around you. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying. Now this is another couplet, another section in chapter 28 starting with 11. He also begins with a prologue. So this section of the antitype is the same introduction that you get from the type. Type introduction. This is another introduction with the antitype. Let's look at it. Son of man, take up a lamentation. What do you understand by lamentation? speaks of death, you lamenting death. Son of man, take up a lamentation. Now it's not the prince, for the king of Tyre. So here is the antitype. And say to him, thus says the Lord God. Do you notice the difference in the way he addresses the antitype? In verse 2, the type is called Prince. And what is he? He is the antitype. He's the type of this antitype that you see on this verse. Son of man, saying to the prince of Tyre, just to illustrate this, prince, and then son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Verse 2, literal. Verse 11, 12. Not literal, but eschatological, end time explanations. Let's continue reading. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. The antitype is called a king. Antitypes are always bigger and better than types. Now for the exposure of his profile. You know, I prayed before coming to present this lecture that God would enlighten my mind and your mind. The type is always bigger than the antitype. Prince, type, king, antitype, lamentation, meaning death. Death of who? Listen to what the rest of the verse tells us. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. 
and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. This is a revelation. You were the seal of perfection. What do you make of this statement? You were the seal of perfection. Full of wisdom, not halfway, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. What does the word lamentation tell you? It tells you of death, demise. There was a time when this being was the most beautiful, perfect creature in the universe. The antitypical king of Tyre. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Lucifer, as the devil used to be called, was clothed with wisdom, glory, beauty above all the other angels. He was the masterpiece of God's creation. You were in Eden, above, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Can you imagine the beauty? The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. In a larger sense, Eden refers to the dwelling place of God. He used to be with God. The context shows that Lucifer had not yet fallen. The, the prophet takes us back to the time when he was perfect. You were in Eden, the garden of God. The creation of our earth, the placement of our first parents in Eden, occurred subsequent to his fall. Every precious stone, what does that mean? The stones named here are found also in the list of gems on the high priest's breastplate. Ah, oh, man, he was a beautiful creature. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Timbrels, pipes, to what does this remind you? was prepared for you on the day you were created. The mention of musical instruments is consistent with Lucifer being the leader of the heavenly choir. When he was created, the Lord gave him all the implements, all the musical implements, so he could start the choir. Can you imagine this exceptionally beautiful being leading billions of angels to sing praises to their creator? Oh, I try to imagine the perfect music, blending of voices, not only in tenor, bass, but maybe many other kind of voices. You've got female voices, soprano, mezzo-soprano, and contralto. And then male voices, countertenor, tenor, baritone, bass. Can you imagine if all seven voices could blend in one single voice? The angelic choir must have been something. He was a musician. I cannot wait to hear angels singing in heaven one day. This is where Lucifer was, and he's lost. Because he was a created being, Lucifer was distinctly inferior to the Father and the Son, in whom was life original, unborrowed, and underived. No beginning. Lucifer claimed equality with the Son. When God said to his son, let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. 
Are you harboring some jealousies in your heart? This is where it all started. He wished to be consulted in the formation of man. He wanted to be part of the design of us. In thus aspiring to the power which it was the prerogative of Christ alone to wield, he fell from his exalted position and became the devil. Watch out for him. He is the great enemy. He is real. It is incorrect to say that God created the devil. He created a beautiful angel, holy and undefiled. But this angel made a devil out of himself. You were the anointed cherub, the top of the range, who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Lucifer, the covering cherub, stood in the light of the presence of God. He was the only angel allowed to stood in the presence of God in close proximity. He was the highest of all created beings and foremost in revealing God's purposes to the universe. What a high position he had. The presence of God is often presented as an environment of color and fire. As you, when you read the book of Revelation. When the Lord appeared to Moses, Aaron and the ancients, his feet were shown resting upon paved work of sapphire stone. Lucifer was used to this. You were the anointed cherub who covers. You know, the various details are mentioned to emphasize the contrast between the original privileges and subsequent fate of Lucifer. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Lucifer's dynamic work of causing rebellion in heaven is compared to the avaricious and often dishonest trade of the ancient people of Tyre. In Revelation 12, Michael, that's Christ, is described as the leader of the forces expelling the arch rebel from heaven. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I laid you before kings, that they might gaze on you. Is this his final destiny? This is a sad story. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. The multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. He devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. We're going to see his destruction, by the way. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Oh, what a promise. At the necropolis of Tyre, the words of Ezekiel kept ringing in my mind. Shall be no more forever. Can you imagine what a peaceful place Lebanon and the entire world would be without a devil? A planet without a devil. 
We've got no idea how he's pestering us, putting thoughts into our minds. When do we use the saying, act of God? In the following exposure of the devil, you may want to change the wording of this phrase, act of God in your policy. Satan delights in war. This is his food. For it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another. The cause of the mess we're in? Here it is. Can you see this statement on social media? This is what he's doing. And people, one nation thinks it's that. And no. There's one enemy. And that's the devil. Climate change? Who do you think is responsible? He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. He is to be blamed. When allowed to afflict Job, how quickly were flocks, herds, servants, houses and children swept away. One trouble after another followed Job in quick succession. It is only God that protects his creatures and save them from the power of Satan, the destroyer. God is looking after us and we have to come close to him to enjoy his protection. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. Did you get this? He will favour and prosper some in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to rebellion. And we see it now, that it is God who is afflicting them. Act of God. The devil is camouflaging himself. He puts all the blame on God. But he's going to be revealed in all his ugliness sooner than we think. Tsunamis, who's behind this? Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, tsunamis, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, tsunamis and earthquakes. Who is responsible for this? Satan. We are living on a dangerous planet with a dangerous enemy. He is responsible for climate changes on this planet. Don't blame anybody else. He is to be blamed. Is he able to destroy harvests? In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. Have you heard of the coronavirus? Where does it come from? From Satan. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and more disastrous. My friend, we are living on a dangerous planet. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. Outbreaks of diseases in the beasts, the animals. Who is the main instigator of the uprisings and calamities in Lebanon? in your country, dear viewer, and in the entire world? It's just one answer. The night when the fighter jets bombed Beirut, I shall never forget. 
Some years ago, I woke up with a fearful noise of sirens. A voice was heard on the intercom. Run for safety. Hide under the tables. Hide under the beds. The building was shaking. Nobody knew what was going on. I thought it was an earthquake. Now instead of hiding under the table or the bed, I ran up to the roof of the building. And what did I see? What a sight. Missiles were turning night into day. The tremor was caused by warplanes going through the sound barrier and everything shook. The next morning I visited the results of the damage of the previous night in spite of people telling me not to go there. I wanted to see it with my own eyes. You know, as I stood there watching this catastrophe, my thoughts went beyond the earthly enemy that caused it. And who do you think is that enemy? Satan. The airstrikes turned the huge power station into black ruins. I realized. I feel so sorry for people who think it is the enemy. They think the enemy. The devil, the destroyer, described by the prophet Ezekiel attire. He's not interested in who wins the war. But in the number of casualties he can destroy in the war. My friend, he's my greatest enemy. He's your greatest enemy. But I have good news for you. This is not going on at forever, at infinitum. God is make, going to make an end to him. God is not going to allow him to carry on with his destructive, sadistic crimes forever. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished. Astonished at you. You have become a horror. And then the words, and shall be no more forever. My dear friend, can you imagine a world without the devil trying to make life unbearable. And this thing is getting worse. The prophet Isaiah prophesied the following of the devil. Listen to this lamentation. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. Who's weakening the nations? Causing uh, monetary problems? Tragic. This is very tragic. He lost the war in heaven. And he was cast out. What was his sin? Let's get it again. For you have said in your heart, I, terrible word, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farther side of the north. There are too many eyes here. I, I, I. What will be his future? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol death, to the lowest depth of the pit. Sin has a tragic ending. What happens at the second coming with the righteous who are alive and the righteous who are in the graves? The living wicked and the deceased wicked, the devil? When Jesus comes, the righteous living will be translated. The righteous dead will be resurrected and they'll meet. The wicked living 
will be destroyed and the wicked in the grave will just remain there. And then we'll be transported to heaven. And what are we going to do during a thousand years of which the Bible speaks? We will get an answer to all our questions and we will look at the innocence of God and the wicked profile of Satan. You know, we have got so many questions. We're going to get a thousand years to check the history channels. And subsequent to the research and fully satisfied and convinced about the fairness and love of God, what will happen then? The end of a thousand years? The new Jerusalem descends. And may we be in that city when it descends, coming down. At that stage, the wicked are resurrected. Can you see the host of wicked people? For a thousand years, the devil had nothing to do, him and his angels. And then a great white throne appears above the city. And when this great white throne appears above the city, the entire story, human story, Satan's story, will be displayed. And we'll see the war between good and evil throughout the ages. And then, when everybody saw that God is righteous, and Satan is the instigator, something dramatic will happen. What happens after the devil, his angels, and all the wicked fall down to acknowledge God's righteousness and love and their own detestable wickedness? Once they've said, God, you're a God of love, you are righteous, we deserve the punishment. Only after every creature and the devil and all his angels admitted their sinfulness and God's righteousness, fire comes down and destroys the wicked. And God will weep. This was not his plan. Question, how long will they burn? Have you heard the Expression lex talionis means in law you're punished according to your transgressions. Earthly law doesn't punish you more than you deserve. God will this punish us just what we earn. The devil will be the longest in the fire, but eventually in the ashes. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean after fire destroyed the wicked and the planet. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. I want to read it again because we don't have harmony here. But one day we will have one pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world. All things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declares that God is love. Father in heaven, at this stage we suffer. The world is in a mess because the enemy is responsible. But soon you will come as a, as, a, as a righteous judge 
to punish the wicked. And we're going to start all over again without an enemy. I pray for everyone listening to this prayer to make things right with you and enjoy a sinless, happy eternity. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.